My name is Liz Snorkel Thomas. I'm the co-founder of Treeline Review. We're a gear review website that makes gear reviews for the rest of us, those who haven't seen ourselves reflect in traditional outdoor media. And one of those demographics, of course, is through hikers who are over 60. I had the privilege of first meeting Dean many years ago and included him. Some of you may know my book, Long Trails, which is a how-to book on through hiking. And Dean was so wonderful in including his voice and his experiences as a hiker over 60. And he very kindly, when we started Treeline Review, uh, suggested this idea of, of looking at hikers and outdoor athletes over 60. We at Treeline Review build inclusive outdoor gear stories that focus on representation and being better stewards of the planet. And one thing that makes us a little bit different than some of the other gear review sites or gear review magazines that you might have seen out there is that we write for everyone. Um, I like to tell people that we're real people who are behind our stories, as, as you can see uh, on today's panel. We're not ChatGBT or a bot or AI. Um, we're people and we're also objective. We have no ads. We're 100% reader supported, which means that whenever you click on a link on our website, it helps continue and support our mission um, at no additional cost to you. Um, so if you decide to purchase any outdoor gear for your next through hike or any of the books that we've talked about, um, if, you per if you click on it um, and purchase through one of the links on our website, you're helping to support this good work. So before we start, um, I wanted to let you know that we will be recording this webinar so that we can share all the wonderful panelists' information with those who are unable to make it. Um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce um, our guests. So um, each guest will have about two minutes, and we will start with our host and moderator, who is Dean. Uh, Dean, if you could tell me your age, the age you started through hiking, um, as well as some of the trails and experiences you've had and what you're planning to hike next. Um, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Liz. One thing I want to add about Treeline is the reviews are honest. And I've bought a bunch of gear from uh, reviews that have appeared in Treeline. It's always been the best. So I'm Dean Krakel. I am 70. I just turned 70 last October. And I hiked through hiked the Colorado Trail in 2015. And I did not finish the Continental Divide Trail in 2018. Um, made it as far as the Wind Rivers in Wyoming. And I'm planning to hike the Colorado Trail again this year, uh, this coming year. And that's, I'm a bike packer and a mountain biker and a uh, backcountry skier and a cross country skier. And, uh, I just got in from a little tour actually got lost on a little trail down by the river <laughs> so <laughs> that's <laughs> that's kind of me and i come from a journalism background i worked for the rocky mountain news and the denver post and i freelanced uh for a number of years but so that's kind of where i'm at and i've i had this idea for this article about hikers over 60 and athletes over 60 and i'm fortunate to live in a community where there are a lot of uh, older athletes and uh, out there kicking ass. So it's awesome. Who's next? Thank you, Dean. Let's Nancy. have Nancy go next. <laughs> so um, in 2009, I retired from dentistry because I wanted to be able to go on adventures instead of just two week vacations. And uh, when I when I retired, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do, but two weeks later, I decided I was going to hike the PCT. And I was 56 at the time, and it was definitely the best adventure of my life, and I found my home. Uh, so since then, I've hiked the Triple Crown, then I hiked the PCT again after I turned 60, and then I've hiked the um, AZT, I hiked in the two islands of New Zealand, the Te Araroa, I hiked in Europe, hiked the, P the Pacific Northwest Trail and a whole bunch of other stuff, the high routes of Sierra and Wind River Range. And when I'm out there, it's just uh, awesome. And I want to just keep going out there. I think I'm sort of most proud of the fact that so far, I haven't had to even take one extra day off or quit a trail because of injury. And uh, 
So maybe you get smarter when you get older. Uh, for planning, about I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> uh, this year, this spring, I'm hoping to do uh, most of the Hey Duke. And uh, then in the fall, um, I'm looking at going to Australia and wow. then hike in between. So it's probably not two minutes, but someone else can talk longer. Thank you so much, Nancy. David. Yeah. Um, I started hiking when I was um, about 19 years old. Um, R Eric Ryback had, had, was the first person to hike the entire Pacific Crest Trail, I think in 1971. And in 1973, I think National Geographic published an article about that and I read it and I thought, oh yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, but I was in school, I didn't have time, but I had some friends who were going to Oregon and I thought I would just hike the Oregon section of that Pacific Crest Trail. So I was working at J.C. Penney's at the time. I went down to J.C. Penney's Sporting Goods and bought all my camping equipment. I didn't know anybody who had ever backpacked. I didn't know anything about backpacking. Nobody I knew backpacked. And um, the experience was about what you would expect for somebody who bought all the equipment at J.C. Penney's. It was um, it was a it was an interesting trip, and it changed my life. Um, I really gained a lot of confidence that I could take care of myself no matter what the circumstances were. So then in 1978, uh, my wife and I had spent a couple of summers uh, with the Youth Conservation Corps as trail crew leaders and, and camp directors. And we had been working on trails in the Aspen area in Colorado. We were going to graduate school in 1981, and we decided we would um, spend the summer backpacking the length of Colorado. This was before there was a Continental Divide Trail. So I just got some maps together and pieced together a, a route uh, through that turned out to be very close to what uh, is now the Continental Divide Trail in Colorado. And we spent 40 days doing that. Um, I started out with a 75 pound pack. My wife, a little person, was carrying 55 pounds of, of gear. Uh, we would make 10 or 12 miles a day at most probably. But that was a, a very interesting summer. And we ended up in the Women Newt Wilderness area, which I just thought was the most beautiful place on the earth. And Daryl and I decided, well, we were gonna live in Colorado and we were gonna be hiking down there all of the time and doing that. That was what we were gonna do. Of course, we went to graduate school and then we had three sons and soccer games. And I played tennis every, every weekend and tournaments and whatnot. So we never got back down there. So in 2014, Daryl had gone to the doctor and has gotten some potentially very bad news. And we had three days to wait for the um, lab reports to come back. And so we just talked about, you know, what we have done in our lives, what we had left to do, what we still wanted to do. She wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands and I wanted to go back to the Wimanooch Wilderness. So um, within six weeks, I was on the Colorado Trail heading for the Wimanooch Wilderness again. And I've been doing that pretty much every summer since because I just feel so much gratitude that I can live in Colorado and still, still do that trail. So kind of a stupid goal, but I, I'd like to be the person that hikes the Colorado Trail the most, uh, the most times. I've got two more times to go before I get that record. <laughs> and I'll hold it for a year before somebody younger comes and breaks it. But um, it's kind of a silly thing, but it, it does motivate me a little bit to do that. Thank you for sharing that, Thanks. David. And for those of you who might not have yet read or skimmed through the story that inspired this panel, which is Dean's story, um, David has some amazing photos in there and some photos of, of some earlier hikes on the Colorado Trail as well. So I would recommend looking at that. Cool. Um, I will let Scott Schrumer take over next. Okay, I'm uh, 70 years old. I've uh, hiked on and off and backpacked since I was a kid. Um, at 56, I had been retired for a couple of years from, I was a retired probation officer. Um, and I found myself bored stiff and I decided to hike uh, three weeks of the PCT at the beginning. And at the end of the three weeks in the desert, I just simply couldn't stop and uh, had to say, sweetie, to my wife, Katie, I need to finish this. <laughs> and I found myself in Canada by the end of the year. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of the end in terms of long trails, because it was just too wonderful. On the one hand, I, I have 
over the years found that uh, it, it's not fair to be gone every year on a long trail. So Katie and I trade off. I'll do a long trail one year. The next year, she picks everything we do. And that's been wonderful. But since then, uh, in 20, that was in 2010 that I hiked the PCT. Uh, 2012, actually, Nancy and I hiked most of the CDT together. We both finished it that year. Um, then the AT, um, Camino Frances, uh, Camino Portugal, uh, the Cheville Escaillel, uh, which was an amazingly incredible thing through ruins and history that just amazing. Uh, the TA, Te Araroa of New Zealand, uh, trekked in Madagascar, and um, also um, last year started the year uh, trekking coasts of Ireland, uh, then uh, the Portuguese Camino, and then I went up with my friends Coyote and Maverick to the Lofoten Islands and uh, hiked the long, well, most of the long crossing of the Lofoten Islands, which was frankly the most beautiful place I have ever been. Um, it's really, really amazing. If you haven't been up there, it's totally worth it. It's uh, way above the Arctic Circle in Norway. And then we went over to the Kungsleden and uh, hiked through Lapland in Sweden uh, on, on an amazing, it's kind of the Swedish John Muir Trail. And uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I had planned on leaving from this pretty much in the next day or two to do the Arizona Trail, but um, looking at the weather down there right now and the 250% of average snowpack, and I think I'm shifting gears away from the Arizona Trail <laughs> this early in the season. I happen to have a window right now. And uh, I may be hiking the Bay Ridge Trail, um, which is my local trail. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, after that, we'll be doing the uh, Camino del Norte in uh, Spain. And, and then the 88 temples in Japan really, really intrigues me. There's a whole lot of other things. Uh, there's no end to wonderful trails out there. Thank you so much, Schrimmer. And Susan, you're next. Hi, I'm Susan Alcorn. I'm uh, 81 and 11 twelfths years, and I started hiking seriously in my 40s. I backpacked my first time on the John Muir Trail, uh, did a section of it with the goal of climbing Mount Whitney. And, and that was as far as my plans went. Uh, my husband had done a lot of backpacking at earlier times, and he kind of I used to do, doing it. But uh, we kind of got the bug. I hear that same theme a lot of places here. People didn't realize what they were getting into, and now it's become a hiking life. <laughs> Since then, uh, with my husband, Ralph, I've section hiked the entire PCT and hiked more than 3,000 miles of, of the Camino trails in Europe. Uh, that includes the Norte, the Primitivo, the Francais, which is the most um, well-known and popular, three of the major trails out of France from Oro, from Le Puy, from Vézelé, uh, uh, from Porto, Portugal. I actually uh, started in Geneva to get to Le Puy, so that was a little couple hundred miles more. Uh, did part of the Moserab, which is in uh, the su southeastern part of Spain. I may have left out something, I don't know, but anyway. So my longest hikes have been the final miles of the PCT because the last section was uh, the rest of Washington, 472 miles. And that was in September of 2010 when um, I was then um, 69. And that was also a big year because we also did the circuit trail in Patagonia and um, uh, and did one of the Camino, Camino routes in France that year. The second longest was, like I said, the Francaise route was one that we've done. And that was the whole Francaise route is about 500 miles. We did about 450, but then 9-11 happened, which kind of changed our plans a bit. But we did go back later and, and finish the whole thing. But I must say the hardest hike probably that I've done was Kilimanjaro, which is only 43 miles, but I think probably the hardest 43 miles I've done. Um, and uh, this year, we're hiking the Robert Louis Stevenson Trail, which is on the Grand Massif in southern uh, central France. And it's about um, 100, and, I think 120 miles, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, really looking forward to doing that. I also, in my downtime, um, write about hiking. So my most recent book is Walk, Hike, Saunter. And in it are stories from both Nancy Hubbard and Naomi, who's the 
the co-coordinator, uh, the co-founder of Treeline Review. I also interviewed and included the story of Scott's wife. So anyway, that that's about women over 45. And my most recent book about a Camino Trail is called Healing Miles. And this is about the Primitivo and the Norte, which are in the northern part of Spain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Carl Pringles, you're up last. <laughs> I'm Carl Readers. I've enjoyed backpacking and hiking through all my life. But being a working stiff and having a family with three kids, uh, doing through hikes wasn't a consideration. When I retired, we moved to Colorado and I joined an organization called Puda Wilderness Volunteers. And we patrol some 54 trails for the Forest Service and clear trees and stuff. So I went on a one week trip with the group crew to clear the trails carrying my 50 pound pack. And this was when I was in my 60s. And my thought was, uh, I'm really too old for this. Uh, backpacking is something for younger people. But then I met David Fanning in that same organization. And he put on a course in ultralight backpacking. And I really got interested in that. And I trimmed my backpack from 50 pounds down to 11 pounds. <laughs> and I discovered that, hey, 11 pounds I can carry. That's, of course, uh, without food and water in it. And then David started talking about his hikes in the Colorado Trail and so forth. And I thought, well, I, I can do that. So another fellow and I, we did the Colorado Trail, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I did that hike at age 73, and I kept thinking about the wonderful trip that I had. So in a couple of years ago, when I turned 80, I decided I'm going to do that trail all by myself, because at that age, I wanted to go at my pace and do it as my thing, and it worked out real well, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I did find it significantly more strenuous hiking at age 80 as opposed to 73. Uh, so I don't have any plans to do through hikes at this point, but I certainly will continue to do backpacking and probably go out for a week or so at various places like the Wind River Mountains where I've been many times and enjoyed it very much. So. Living in Colorado, there are a lot of backpacking opportunities, and Wyoming is right next door, which has tremendous places as well. Thank you so much, Carl. And at this point, I will let Dean take it away. Dean will ask our panelists some questions that we already think might be on everyone's radar for the next half hour or so. And then I will let Dean know that time is up, and then we will switch over to Q&A. And in the meantime, if a question comes up, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your toolbar, and feel free to just type in whatever your question is whenever. And when we get to the Q&A portion at the end, um, I will read them off to our panelists and to Dean, who I'm sure also will have some great insight. I started the Colorado Trail when I was 62. And although I had backpacked, um, and I'd also like done a lot of trips on the rivers and things like that, I didn't know that there was anything called a through hiker. I didn't know that there was a through hiking culture. I didn't know a lot of that stuff. When I met some guys on the Colorado Trail that had a data book, I was like, what is that? <laughs> and uh, I set out to do the Colorado Trail, and I was going to knock it out in two weeks. I was uh, training pretty hard and everything in that time. And uh, so I loaded a bunch of energy, energy bars in my pack and took off. And it was a flaming failure. Um, so I came back, and the next year I was like, get serious about this. And that's when I met Liz and did a lot of research about it. But I would like to know from, from you, what's the hardest thing about being an older hiker? What challenges you the most? <laughs> not so much anymore, but the, when I first started hiking, the most challenging thing was not being able to keep up with young people. Uh, that, and that, I've always, I was a sort of a competitive uh, runner for many years and um it was hard for me <laughs> this to be uh thinking 
that I really needed to hike my own hike and uh, just be content with that. It took me it took me a couple of trips on the Colorado Trail to come to terms with that. These days I go at a snail's pace and I'm I'm perfectly content with it. <laughs> I, I still feel that way some of the time. I, I understand what you're saying. On the other hand, we're often hiking, especially on the European uh, trails where we don't see anybody. <laughs> so there's really nobody to compare ourselves to. The Camino, when we first hiked it in uh, 2001, nobody I knew had even heard of it. I mean, I well, I guess somebody had, because somehow I, well, actually we heard about it in the newspaper uh, a few years before we retired and were able to do it, but pretty much people weren't doing it. Now it's become extremely well known, um, particularly when the movie The Way came out and you know everybody started finding out about it. But the trails that we do now tend to be ones that still we see, you know, maybe one or two people in a day, and um, and of course we we if we stay well we stay in a small hotel or we stay on someone's back bedroom or whatever on some trail because the ones other than the Francais don't have the same accommodations along the way, so we will meet our hosts and so on. But really we're seeing very few hikers. So I don't have to worry about how fast anybody else is going. I just have to worry about getting to my destination. So that helps a lot for that. I have to share David's view of hiking at 80, except I recognize right off the bat that uh, at 80, I would be going at a slower pace, but it still bugged the hell out of me to have these young kids, <laughs> ages 60 and 50s and stuff, just zooming <laughs> right by me. But I quickly got adjusted to that and did my own pace. And I have to say that I think the hardest thing for me is also just the the fact that you're not as strong, not as fast as you were just a few years ago, um, at 70 anyway. And and also that recovery is much more important to me. Um, I used to, I, when I, by the time I got to Oregon, I was, you know, you're knocking out 30 to 35 miles a day on the PCT a few years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I don't know that I could do that today. I mean, I find if I push too hard, um, I really, really lose power and I need some time off. I had a, a crash and burn on the Great Divide Trail in Canada. I made it to Banff just about, you know, not even quite halfway and I had to come home when I simply was not recovering. And I had been pushing, my, my usual thing is to start very slowly. I'm training all year long, but I, <laughs> Start very slowly, 10 to 12 miles a day. Don't break 15s until the second week and 20s on the third week. And then sky's the limit. But on that trail, I had started with a bunch of young people that I love at about 20 miles a day. And it's there's a lot of up and down. And um, by the second week, the end of the second week, I think it was, I simply wasn't recovering. And I thought I was having a pulmonary embolism or something, which I'd had after Madagascar. So I actually flew home to an emergency room. And after all kinds of tests, the doctor looks at me, looks me in the eye and he, he says, old man, you just kicked your own ass. <laughs> I simply had pushed too hard. I mean, because there was nothing wrong at all, except that I had pushed too hard. And that, that didn't used to be the case. So for me, it's it's forcing myself to actually be sensible about it. I think uh, the hardest thing is uh, not being able to carry as much weight. So always having a light pack is good for people of all ages. But I think for older hikers, it's uh, carry a light pack or go home. Uh, <laughs> it's just you, you have to get light. Um, and the good thing about being light is uh, in the beginning of the trail, when you meet younger people with heavy packs, you can actually hike faster than them. <laughs> once once they throw out half their pack and uh, get in shape, you can't keep up with them anymore, but they've already decided that you're pretty strong and badass. So that is good. <laughs> so how did everybody stay healthy? Um, I seem to bounce from one injury to another. This year, I've been kind of injury free relatively speaking but so how does it how do you how do you do that i mean is it uh do you train specifically for your hiking is it a nutritional thing what what's the key to staying injury free uh, for me i think it's uh stay active year round um i mean i 
I say that and I'm doing less than I probably ever have, but I walk all the time. And uh, I think eating uh, nutrition is super important. I don't take ibuprofen ever. Um, I think pain is telling you something that is wrong and you need to address what's wrong um, and then, you know, fix that and then keep moving. Mm. And I think, I mean, most aches and pains, I think if you take ibuprofen within a couple hours, the pain will go away. And if you don't take ibuprofen and move, the pain goes away in a couple hours. The thing I right. find in doing a through hike is the preparation for it. You know, it's going to be tough. And I find myself very motivated at that stage by doing a lot of hiking, biking, working out in the gym, and doing all those things in preparation. And when I don't have a through hike planned ahead of me, especially at age 82 now, I find it a little difficult to keep up the kind of training that I've done before doing a through hike. What, what I do is I try to get out every day. It doesn't always happen, but pretty much every day. And usually three times a week, I'm climbing a mountain we have uh, in the Bay Area, the Mount Diablo or Mount Tamalpais, uh, with a bunch of younger people. But I, at this point, I'm, I'm behind them. Although there's some people that are older than me that blast up the thing even stronger. But the other thing for me is having a community of people that I really like um, on trail. And we train together all the time. And there are some people in their 20s and 30s and some people in their mid seventies. And having that motivation year round um, keeps me you know, ready to go. And there's a, a couple of tips that I learned from a fellow a trail name was Bigfoot. He's a wonderful hiker. I learned on the, on the PCT, he had gone through all kinds of agonies on the AT. He's a very, very tall guy with the biggest feet I've ever seen. And he said he did used to do the uh, overuse injury uh, presentations for the kickoff for the P Pacific Crest Trail. And the, his tips were that if you start to feel something going wrong, that you've got an injury coming up, there's three things you just do immediately. Slow down, shorten your day, shorten the distances you're going, and lighten your pack. Try to throw out more stuff. It might be even, you know, food that you, extra stuff, whatever you can do, but slow down, shorten your distance and lighten the pack. And then you can often walk through uh, the beginning of a, of, of an overuse injury. Slowing down, I think is the most important thing. Don't, don't go fast. It just gets worse. I pretty much live on ibuprofen <laughs> as do, every, as do everybody I, I interact with. Um, <laughs> Uh, Maybe I will too in 80 years. I mean, 20 years. I'm, I'm only 71, but um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I hang out with a bunch of tennis players and pickleball players. Um, I, and I, I walk with the Pooter Wilderness volunteers quite often doing hikes and whatnot. But um, mostly I think it's just being active all of the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a real key thing. But I'm telling you, it's getting harder and harder. And I was I was telling Dean the other day, I think this is the first year where I've seriously thought about training for a hike. Normally, I just walk myself into hiking shape. But um, it's getting to the point where <laughs> you need some serious, um, some serious training to be able to do these things. The body's just not responding in the way it used to. I think I, I, I tell people you have, you have a choice. You can either train ahead of time or you can train your first few weeks on the trail. Uh, and since I'm going to be, well, for example, the, the, I think the most training I've ever done, serious training beyond you know, just hiking more locally was uh, when we were doing Kilimanjaro because I didn't have time to train on that. I had to be ready to go. So, you know, I was doing Pilates. Uh, we, we do different kinds of dancing. Um, we were, we live in the hills where there are, um, steps that people take to get down to the, to the buses to take them to the city, for example, to San Francisco. And so those are great for training. And I can remember for a while trying to do them two at a time to increase, you know, to increase my, my ability and my aerobic exercise. And the other day I was in Berkeley and I went to a, um, parking garage and parked on the sixth floor 
And then I thought as I was going up them, oh yeah, this is a good way to uh, to train. I'm, there are people that I hear from that don't have any hills around them and they wonder what they can do. So, you know, those are some of the possibilities. And is there, um, we talked in the article a bit about essential equipment. Is there uh, gear? I know every, all of you use poles. Is that, that's right, isn't it? And the advantage of using poles, because there's kind of a little bit of, controversy about poles i found i have started not using poles and i actually i like it but i haven't put on a heavy pack or anything is there anything other than using poles that you consider essential for older hikers a light pack yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i think the uh, satellite communicators uh, uh, is a really good idea i think our chance of having a medical emergency is higher um and those you can communicate with the rescuer and tell them what the emergency is and maybe uh, not make them uh, 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 endanger their own life as much to get to you if they know you can wait it out until the weather clears or whatever. But seriously, I think a light pack is the best piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. I've actually started thinking about a light body. I've been losing weight <laughs> trying to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> easier it's easier to lose weight than to take more weight out of my pack which seems to get bigger every year with more photography gear <laughs> yeah i don't want to lose more weight <laughs> for me it's getting a good night's rest and it's a it, i really need a good air mattress i used to be able to sleep on a little thin foam and uh, i haven't been able to do that for years and for a long time i carried a full length uh, air mattress now all i find is i need a, a i have the short it goes down a little below my hips. So it's a very light thing, goes up over my head. And then um, you put your legs onto your backpack and uh, that keeps you elevated off the cold ground. But, uh, and I've done that now for quite a few years, but I need a good air mattress under my hips and shoulders. Otherwise I just don't sleep. And then you're a wreck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> On uh, older people, stuff is safety considerations so as as it was mentioned uh in reach two-way satellite communication the trekking poles first aid kit ca carrying a map and a data book the compass i carry a whistle in case i run into trouble and can't yell all all, all day then i blow the whistle and i also wear an id bracelet so if somebody finds me on the trail uh they can get in touch with people to get help for me. That's a good idea. I just wanted to add, uh, take your common sense, <laughs> being aware of the risks and your abilities to handle them, which may be changing over time. This is not, of course, true only for older hikers, but definitely something that, uh, as Scott said, when he was having problems, he didn't just keep going to the point where he you know, permanently damaged himself. He realized, he had, you know, it was time to get off the trail. <laughs> so we talked about um, what's the hardest thing as an older hiker. So what is the best thing about being an older hiker? What keeps you going out there? I mean, this is, it's really, it's tough to do. So why do it, especially at an older age? What do you derive from it? What do you get from it? You know, I, I find the hike always to be, um, you know, a spiritual experience, I guess, is what you would call it. Um, it's a walking meditation. Um, I feel immense gratitude when I'm hiking. Um, I know there's one point on the Colorado Trail, every time I get to that point, I, I just, my eyes fill up with tears. I, I don't know if I'll ever see that place again. And it's very meaningful to me. And I think um, I always come back a better husband, better parent. Um, I think because I just um, spend time thinking about the things that matter to me when I'm on when I'm walking. Oh, I I totally agree with you, David. That's it's it's always been a walking meditation for me. Uh, the long long days and, and doing I love it, absolutely love it. And I I think one of the best things is that at seventy I'm still doing it. You know, I'm still out there. 
And that is just amazing. I mean, I'm really proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> All of us can be proud of being yeah. on these trails, not just taking a little walk, but doing thousands of miles at our age. It's, it's pretty amazing. But another thing that is wonderful for me is the community of hikers out there, young and old both. And to be part of that community, like this past weekend, the Alda West American Long Distance Hiking Association West had a ruck in Berkeley that Nancy was there, Snorkel was there, Naomi. I see all these wonderful, wonderful people on a regular basis by being part of this community and, and the group that I hike with uh, regularly. I'm, it's uh, an amazing altruistic um, group that tends to attract long distance hikers. True. I, I love being part of that community too. I also love the fact that we often find trail angels people that help you out for, you know, no other reason than they want to help somebody else. So the strangers that will help you, the people that we stay with, uh, either like on the PCT where you're hiking to their place or whether you're, uh, you know, hiking in, in another country and people open their homes to you or, or you're hitchhiking and you, somebody that doesn't know you, you know, will, will pick you up. Uh, the, the times that people either, um, uh, sit, sit along, sit alongside the the trail somewhere to hand out food to people or drinks to people, um, things like like Scott mentioned this this ruck this weekend that we all went to. Uh, most of the people there were volunteering. You know, Scott was was doing our food for all those meals. So it's it's just an incredible community, and I'm very, I'm very proud to be t of it too. The other thing for me is um, I I like going places that I've been before, but I also like discovering new places. So uh, the fact that you can walk across a country, um, the fact that you can uh, see places at a pace that you wouldn't see if you were driving by in a car or even going on a tour, those are just wonderful to me. And it, it, uh, it reaffirms your faith in the, in the human, human race to have those kinds of experiences. I agree with all that. Um... And you guys said it very well. I think the other thing is just uh, gratitude to still be out there, still be alive, healthy enough to do it, as we all have friends and family that weren't so fortunate. And there's no guarantees that you're going to get to keep doing it. So mm -hmm. it helps to cherish every minute out there because it really is special. And hopefully really I can is. keep yeah. going out there. It really is special. I always find that. Uh... My faith in humanity gets renewed. There, are, I have met so many wonderful people, um, hikers and non-hikers, and just people that kind of help. And it always amazes me the trail angels, you know, to the extent they go to help hikers. But that always really renews my sense of people. You get to do a lot of hitchhiking, get to hear a lot of stories, and. Uh, you know, on the, on the CDT, I remember a woman out of New Mexico driving along and giving people cookies. And that was just awesome. I think it's about time for Q&A. Is that correct? Um, we have one that's pretty appropriate to what we were just talking about is how do you find a group of, of people? How, how do you find, you know, we talked about a little bit about all the West. Are, are there other places you found to connect with hikers? Well, when I first started um, hiking fairly seriously in my early 40s, I joined the, the local chapter of the Sierra Club, and they took us on some incredible hikes. And, and I, sometimes I'd be in this group of 30 or 40 people, and they're kind of trailing across, you know, spread out, and I'd, I'd be talking to one person for a while, and then I'd drop back and walk with somebody else, and uh, that was just a great way to be introduced to it. I also did, uh, we have also been on some of the projects of wilderness volunteers, and that's a wonderful group of people that love the outdoors also. Uh, David and I both belong to Poudre Wilderness Volunteers, which has some 300 members that uh, patrol some 54 trails for the Forest Service. So you meet a lot of people that way. But the other thing is when you do a through hike, it is amazing the number of people that you meet and you hit it off right away and they become like they've been your lifelong friends. So as far as being on the trail, uh, just 
going solo is not a problem at all. It's just a wonderful opportunity to make a lot of new friends. I agree. Being on the trail is a really good place to meet people that like to hike. Um, <laughs> or just meet Shroomer and join his group on uh, Mount Diablo <laughs> and you'll meet a whole bunch of people. <laughs> a good way to get in shape. Yes. <laughs> They, they call me a missionary out there. I, <laughs> you know, years ago, um, when there weren't the thousands and thousands of people on the trails that there were uh, in 2010, um, you know, I wanted to meet people that were interested. I, I was so jazzed by the PCT. It really changed my life having hiked that trail. And I started putting out invitations. I, I'm not saying to do this today, but something like it on the Appalachian Trail web pages, on the Continental Divide Trail web pages, and on the Pacific Crest Trail web pages, inviting people to a party at my house. And I did that for quite a few years before. I mean, at this point, I think I, I wouldn't be able to put them in the, you know, there'd be so many people that would come. But it was usually 80 to 100 people. I, Susan, you came. I mean, Nancy, you've come to those. I some of the people, Coyote and other friends that are just dear, dear friends to me, um, came to those parties. And we're, we've been hiking now together for many years. Um, yeah, um, Georgie Heitman, I mean, there were just trail angels would come. Anybody interested in the long trails would come. So I'm saying, reach out in kind of an open way. Uh, in some, I'm, I'm not sure how your community could do that, but I did it across country. Um, 12 years ago, and then 10 years ago, I did a, a number of those and really attracted some very, very good people. <laughs> we have another question. Has your attitude towards risk changed over the years? I think it has. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's commonly thought that it's safer to hike with other people. And I'm not that sure that it really is because I tend to, I will go along with, uh, like get swept up in the enthusiasm of doing something that I wouldn't do on my own. So sometimes I feel like I've been more at risk by being in a group than being on my own. Um, on the other hand, I do think that as I get older, um, I think I'm willing to take on more risk because I'm not risking as many good years and maybe I'm preventing some bad ones. Um, so that, you know, if you're a teenager and you die, you lose a whole bunch of good years. If you're 90 and you die, you're not losing that many good years. So I don't know. We'll see what I do. <laughs> I'm cautious by nature, so I'm not going to get real risky anyway. It's made me more aware of uh, how long it takes me to recover from injuries. That kind of reduces my taking risks. But on the other hand, I really kind of like to go solo um, on a lot of my trips. And I think being older actually has increased, like, like you say, Nancy, it's kind of like, well, why not? You know, that's my trail name. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know there must be a bunch of us want to die on a trail. I, I <laughs> <laughs> one of the things of hiking by myself is that i have the freedom of doing anything i want and on a hot day when you sort of get drowsy and you get a little tired i learn to go way off the trail where nobody can see me and i get out my air mattress i blow it up i set my iphone to buzz me in an hour and i take a, a very enjoyable nap that's another one of those nice things of going solo but you certainly don't want to have somebody see an 82 year old sprawled out <laughs> the trail so i make a point of going where nobody can see me i was gonna i was gonna mention more frequent naps carl exactly yeah <laughs> what, one of the adjustments that i made is it used to be a ritual for me to get up in the morning watch the sunrise sip my coffee eat my cereal and what I find is at my slow pace of hike, what I did was I get up the first thing in the morning and I hike for about an hour. And my first break is fixing my breakfast and enjoying that. And that way I can get more miles in a day. 
because I ended up uh, hiking 12 miles on the average a day, starting at sunrise and actually ending when it gets dark. Whereas these youngsters, of course, will do twice as many miles and uh, stop hiking midday and so forth. But uh, at my age, I had to use a full day for hiking. Yeah, I'm always surprised at the people who complain about the afternoon thunder showers in Colorado. I, I always <laughs> use those for a nap. Um. <laughs> I'm sorry, that lightning is my my, my scariest thing. <laughs> so I'm not <laughs> napping during that. <laughs> <laughs> and we there's one comment for you susan uh ellen wrote thank you susan for writing walk hike saunter this book inspired me to and eventually my husband to hike the camino francais last year mm -hmm. i'm now 59 and hoping to do another long hike at 60. we did get, we did take um both first aid classes with sierra club and uh, we went snow camping with the Sierra Club a couple of times because when we got serious about completing the, the um, Pacific Crest Trail, we thought, well, we better know what to do in case something comes up and we need to take shelter or make our own shelter. So I do recommend that and taking, um, you know, snow camping and snow uh, skills classes so that you know what to do if you're getting you know, traveling through snow, to know how to self-arrest and that kind of thing. I see someone asked about, uh, has anyone left the trail because of injury? And what was that like? I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> we can all answer Go ahead, that. Humor. Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, I, I was mentioning before, I had to leave the trail uh, on the uh, Great Divide Trail in Canada, which was marvelous, because I didn't, I thought i had was doing something bad to my heart. I was simply not recovering uh, every morning. And it was, turns out it was because I was pushing way too hard at my age. And I was not pushing harder than I could have done maybe five years ago. Um, but it was too much um, at this age. And I needed to be going at a slower pace. Or at least that's all they found. They couldn't find anything. It was really, really hard to leave a trail. I, I had never left a trail before. For injury, and um, actually, this summer, I the Lofoten Islands were so steep. It's kind of like Tierra del Fuego at sea level, or the top three thousand feet of the Sierra at sea level, with the fjords in between. It's stunningly beautiful, but you're just going straight up and down and crab crawling down crevices. And after I think it was of seven days, I really, really needed a zero day, and I don't normally really, really need a zero day. And uh, actually, we we only had enough time to make it. To, we were hooking up with friends from the Te Araroa who were meeting us for the Kungsleden in Sweden, which was wonderful. But so we had to get off anyway. And I got my zero on a train, but I don't think I could have continued on. And so that would have been another one. Uh, so I, I think it's really imperative for me to get my pace under control. You know, whether I'm with young people or not. <laughs> right. I was. <laughs> I came off the Colorado Trail because I tore my rotator cuff in my right shoulder. And uh, it was because I had, I don't know, rapture of the sunset or something. I'd take off and started running with my pack, which is not a bright thing to do. <laughs> and I caught my toe, tore the rotator cuff. Um, I got into the hike. I had a couple friends that were hiking with me at that point on the trail for a section and they helped me get down to the ER in Frisco where the doctor told me he's kind of like you're done and uh I wasn't done I was 120 miles from finishing and so he gave me Percocets and a sling and off I went and uh I did finish it it took me like four weeks to complete the last 120 miles but did it and it was it was hard going off the trail but you know, I was lucky I got back on it. We're talking also, about I, I think you have to give yourself permission to fail as well when you're out there because you can, you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, we were talking about risks earlier. And I think one of the things that I have <laughs> thought about mostly is falling, uh, especially when I'm hiking alone by myself. And on the Arizona Trail in 2018, I fell twice, <laughs> and uh, the first time I fell, I just lay there for quite some time wondering if I was ever going to get up again because I my legs were twisted and so forth. 
The second time I fell, I actually tore my rotator cuff too and had to get off the trail because I couldn't, I couldn't lift my arm. I went to take a picture and realized I couldn't get my camera up above my waist and was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and that took, that takes a year to heal. And when you can't do any hiking, I mean, it's terrible. So, yeah. So I, I pay attention when I'm going downhill, especially on these gravelly trails. And it goes back to what you're saying about common sense, you know, be aware. Okay. We have a couple of questions about trails. What trail would you recommend for a new through hiker? And what is your favorite long trail as an over 60 hiker that is not the PCT, CDT, or AT? Colorado trail. <laughs> and that that's a wonderful trail. Also, from the sense that it isn't uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 mile hikes that a lot of you do. It's only 500 miles, but uh, it's a wonderful trail. I have uh, a couple of favorite of uh, the trails in, in Europe. One is the uh, the Norte, obviously north, northern Spain, and it goes, starts in the Basque country and it continues from, you know, it starts in the Pyrenees basically and goes all the way to the um, to the west coast and to Santiago, that's 500 miles. There's another trail that starts in the same general area called the Primitivo. Uh, that's what, Scott, about 150 miles, I think. Also leads into the, the uh, Santiago de Compostela. Um, I, I just really love hiking in France also. I love the food, <laughs> I love the countryside, I love the people. I'd speak very little French and they are still very kind to me. So those are my, my favorites out of the country. I think, I that, think you um, can take the long trails and take them in pieces. Exactly. That's the way I did it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's all right. Um, I think the Tahoe Rim Trail is a perfect uh, through hike to start with because it's gorgeous. It's uh, like, it's got great views. It's got, a bunch of access points. So if you're on there and things aren't working, it's easy to get off. Um, you could change your gear around, get back on, um, keep going. Uh, I think it's a it's a really good trail. It's 170 miles. All right. The permits are pretty easy to get so far. Might be changing. And I'll throw a couple out there for new hikers um, in in uh, Europe, and that is. The um, all of the politics right now in Israel are so kind of up in the air and awful. Uh, you may not want to go, but the Shvilishkaya is absolutely a marvelous trail uh, from a lot in the southern. You, you zigzag through the most amazing history and uh, stuff that you've ever seen. And it's a fantastic walk. Uh, you know, you camp over a valley where David and Goliath fought. You camp over, you know, in little places just every the whole way. And, and most of it is much, much more ancient than Christian, Jewish, and Arab uh, history. I mean, it's, you, you camp with Nabataean spice forts over you or 6,000 year old Egyptian copper mines. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal trail. I think it was National Geographic gave it uh, one of the 10 top trails in the world. It's fascinating. But the other one is the, the one I did this last summer, the Kungsleden in Sweden, which is not that hard. And there are um, huts every seven to 10 miles where you can usually buy food. Um, there's a, if you pay to stay in the hut, you can uh, use the kitchen there, or you can pay a little bit to stay outside, but you're in, you're way above the Arctic circle, but the temperatures, there's a lot of rain, but the temperatures are no worse than San Francisco. We had in two months of hiking in the Arctic, we had one night with a little bit of frost on the tent. It was absolutely delightful except for the rain, but you get into these huts and they've got a warming you know, room to hang up your gear and they've got a sauna. Oh, geez, <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. So it's a really fun trail. You start at Abisko way, way in the north of Sweden and hike Lapland. So it's reindeer and Sami culture and all of that. It, it's exceedingly beautiful. Um, the biggest glaciated landscapes I've ever been on. Uh, just gorgeous, and the berries to die for, but a very fun, not too difficult hike. Kungsleden, <laughs> which means the king's way. Uh, this is a good one, I think. Anyone else find it's harder to stay warm as we age, especially when not moving? At 98 pounds, I find it harder to carry the extra weight of the warmer gear. 
but need it more than I used to. Anyone carrying extra weight in that category? I, I added a pound to my backpacking trip second time. Uh, like somebody mentioned, uh, there are options for pads that are only three quarters length, which are much lighter. But uh, I got cold and uh, I did two things on the second hike. One is to get a insulated pad, which has an R factor. And the other is I got some down long underwear to put on. And with that, I was very comfortable, but it did add another pound to my pack. So I went from 11 to 12 pounds. Well, and if, if cold is the issue, I, I'm i a real believer in down pants. I use them on a lot of trails um, just because they will add 10 to 15 degrees to your sleep system. And the minute you get into warmer weather, you can mail them home. So you're mailing, I think they're a half pound, something like that. You're mailing eight ounces that you can get rid of that you don't have to carry a much bigger sleeping bag for the whole way. Um, but anyway, that, yeah, I love down pants. I'm a convert. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think, I think what we need to do next is have a what's in my pack session for all of you guys, because there's been a lot of questions about gear. Uh, no surprise there. But unfortunately, we're out of time. I, there are such so many great questions. I wish we could answer them all. I can't thank you all enough for being here today. It's I, I would agree the community that we all are a part of is a very special community. And uh, it's it's great to be able to spend time with you virtually. Mm -hmm.